morning year four. Um, I have already tried to do this twice. This is my third time. My, um, my brain's just not working today and I don't know why. Uh, but happy Monday. I hope that you had a lovely weekend and managed to relax and have a bit of a break from work. Uh, but you're ready to get started again today. So um, Moz is there, obviously. He climbed himself up. He's getting much braver sitting higher up. Um, he's got his arms comfortably in his lap. He's sitting comfy. Hope you are as well. It's another long chapter. So um, get snuggled up and hopefully enjoy. So chapter four. Mrs Carter was delighted to hear that Maya could not keep up with the twins. The first real smile they'd seen on her lit up her flabby face and she gave permission readily enough for Maya to work on her own. Of course Beatrice and Gwendolyn are very intelligent. I've always known that. She gave Maya quite a kind look. I dare say you'll catch up soon enough if you apply yourself. So each morning Maya was set to work on the veranda at a small wicker table. Miss Minton gave her exercises and projects and occasionally she left Dr Borman and the twins to see if she needed help. But mostly Maya worked on her own and she loved it. She learnt about the explorers who had braved incredible hardship to map the rivers and mountains of Brazil. She copied the drawings made by the early naturalists, drawings of marmosets and tapirs and anacondas, and of the great trees which supplied the wo world with precious woods and rare medicines. And it was as though Miss Minton's books gave her back the mysterious country she'd longed to see, and which the Carters had shut out. She was told to write stories about whatever interested her. She learnt poetry by heart, and she wrote it. From time to time she would knock on the door of the dining room where the twins were doing their lessons and ask how to spell a word, choosing an easy one so that the girls could despise her. How do you spell table? Maya would say, trying to sound worried, and Beatrice would tell her how to spell it and say, goodness, can't you even spell that? But mostly no one took any notice of what Maya was doing. The teaching had been good at the academy, but Miss Minton was a born teacher. Not that Maya enjoyed all of her lessons. Minty insisted on an hour of maths each day. She also made her go on learning Portuguese and Maya was about to complain when she tried out a few words on the sullen maid, Tapey, and found that Tapey understood her and almost smiled. It was because Miss Minton was determined that she should learn about the country that she lived in that Maya had her first meeting with Mr Carter in his study. The girls were drawing a teapot, according to the instructions of Dr. Bullman, narrowing their round blue eyes as they measured the exact distance from the handle to the spout. When Miss Minton came to see Maya and said, It's time you learnt to draw proper maps. Go and ask Mr. Carter if there's a chart or a map of the country surrounding his house. Maya looked up alarmed. She'd scarcely spoken to Mr. Carter, who mostly sat silent and gloomy at meals and vanished as soon as he could. Must I? asked Maya. Yes, said Miss Minton, and returned to the twins. Mr Carter's room was the end one in the main part of the house. As Maya knocked on the door, she heard shuffling and rustling, as though papers were being quickly put away. Then he called, come in! The room was dismal and dark, like all the rooms in the house, and the air was full of smoke from the cigarettes which hung from Mr Carter's lower lip, which he was, uh, whenever he was alone. It was also dusty because he did not allow the maids to come in and clean. The charts and, charts and sales figures tacked to the wall had curling edges and looked as though they'd been there for years. Piles of paper lay in untidy heaps on the drawers and filing cabinets. But in the centre of Mr Carter's desk was a cleared space covered in a white cloth and on it were small round objects which he was examining carefully through a lens. At first Maya thought they might be samples of rubber or specimens of soil or seeds, but when she came closer she gave a little gasp. <gasps> they were eyes, glass eyes, but still definitely eyes, and not the eyes of dolls or teddy bears. No, these were human eyes, and so carefully made that it was hard to believe they weren't real. The back of the eyes were hollowed like seashells to fit over the muscles of the person who'd worn them but the front was perfectly copied ball. There were blue eyes and brown eyes and hazel eyes and in the centre of the coloured part a black pupil which looked as though it must really let in the light. As you see I'm sorting my collection, said Mr Carter and he picked up one of the largest balls, crisscrossed, 
with tiny scarlet veins and held it to the light. This is the left eye of the Duke of Wainford. He lost the real one in the Battle of Waterloo. It's worth a pretty penny, I can tell you. Maya swallowed. How do you get a hold of them? Oh, I have a man who sends them out from England. There's quite a few dealers in the business. They get them from the undertakers as often as not. Most people don't mind too much what happens afterwards. He put down the Duke's eye and picked up another one. Now this one's really special. It's the right eye of a famous actress who was burnt in a fire in the theatre. Tilly Tyndale, she was called. Look at the colour, it's as blue as the sky, isn't it? You wouldn't believe that that would fetch, of course. Well, you wouldn't believe what that would fetch. Of course, the really valuable ones are the doubles, but they're rare. You mean two eyes from the same person? From someone who lost both eyes? Mr Carter nodded. I've got three sets and they're worth more than the rest put together. He put a hand towards the blue velvet box, then changed his mind. The doubles were too valuable to show a child. I tell you, said Mr Carter, if this house went up in flames, it's my collection I'd save. After you'd save your wife and the twins, said Maya. He looked sharp, up sharply. Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course, that goes without saying. Now, what was it that you wanted? Miss Minton wondered whether you might have a map or a chart of the country around the house. It's just to borrow for a little while. Mr Carter sighed. <sighs> but he got up and he began to rummage in a number of drawers. Here you are, he said, returning with a rolled up chart. It covers ten square miles behind the house, but bring it back. Maya thanked him and left. She'd never seen such a sad room, or such a sad hobby. But the map was interesting. Shook it to her room and waited till evening when Miss Minton came to do what she called hearing Maya read. Since Maya had read fluently since she was six years old, this mostly meant asking Maya what she thought of David Copperfield or arguing with her about what sentimental poems which Maya liked and Miss Minton didn't. Look, I've been trying to copy this, but it's difficult. Would you believe there are so many little rivers and streams and channels behind the, behind the house? Miss Minton bent to look. They're called Igapes, she said, and the Indians go up and down them in their canoes, even the ones that seem to be choked with reeds and are often naviga navigable. It looks as though one could go to Manaus, the back way, not down the main river, if one had a canoe. And if one knew the way, said Miss Minton, looking at the maze of the little waterways. After she left, Maya again climbed onto the chair and looked out to the huts at the back. She found out how to loosen the netting nailed over the window and so could undo the catch. She knew the lullaby now that came from the middle hut where Tapi and Furo lived. Sometimes she hummed it to herself in bed and she was beginning to make out more and more people. The girl who had walked across the first night in her bright, bright dress was called Conchita. Her baby was a demon, always trying to wriggle out of her grasp. And the old lady in the middle hut who tended the chickens was Furo's aunt. But blow the wind southerly, the tune that she heard someone whistle on the first night, never came again. That Maya's lessons were so interesting it was a was a good th that Maya's lessons were so interesting was a good thing because the twins went on being unfriendly and rude. Each day when she saw them in the fresh white dresses which Tapey's younger sister washed and ironed in a small steamy hut beside the bo boathouse, she felt hopeful. The fair girls, their pretty dresses, their pink and blue ribbons, seemed to belong to the twins she had imagined before she came. But the girls lived strange lives inside the dark and stuffy house, like those pale insect grubs that exist only to be fed and groomed by others. The twins ordered the servants to comb their hair, pick up their handkerchiefs, iron their hair ribbons. They never went anywhere alone, following each other even to the bathroom. And when they shook their heads or nodded, they moved exactly together, as though they were puppets pulled by the same string. Yet one did not get the feeling that they were particularly fond of each other, or indeed of anybody or any anything else. As for Maya, the girls never lost a chance of snubbing her or making her feel unwanted. Mostly it was just words, but sometimes when no one was there, they pushed her against the rough cast wall of the corridor or dug their elbows into her. It was a long time since Maya had thought that Gwendolyn's pinch on that first day had been an accident. Why do they hate me, Minty? she asked, bewildered. What have I done to them? And always, Miss Minton answered, they're not used to other girls yet. Give them time. Then at the beginning of the following week, they went into Manaus. 
perhaps Maya may prefer to stay behind and rest, suggested Mrs Carter hopefully. Oh no, please! Mr Murray has made it clear that Maya is to have dancing lessons and music lessons also, said Miss Minton firmly. Since the twins' lessons were being paid for by the money Maya had bought, there was nothing Mrs Carter could do. They travelled down the Negro in the same dark green launch that had bought them from the ship. Mrs Carter and the twins sat in the cabin with the doors and windows shut. Maya and Miss Minton sat on deck. Your hair will get all messy, said Beatrice, but Maya needed to feel the wind on her face. She felt as though she'd been in prison for a week. Though they docked there, Maya had not really seen the city. And now as they drove from the harbour in a cab drawn by an old horse in a sun hat, she was amazed by the beauty and elegance of Manaus. They drove past mansions painted in every colour, pink and okra and blue, with flowers tumbling from window boxes. In the gardens surrounding them were blossoming orange and lemon trees and mangoes and wonderful creepers climbing over the railings. They passed two churches, a museum, a little park with a bandstand and a children's playground. Everywhere were busy people, black women carrying baskets on their heads, Indian women with babies on their hips, messenger boys, smartly dressed Europeans and nuns ferrying lines of little children. And on the far side of a huge square paved in swirling mosaics stood a magnificent building roofed in tiles in green and gold with the eagle of Brazil in precious stones soaring over the top. Oh look, said Maya, it's the theatre, isn't it beautiful? That's where Clovis is going to act, the boy we met on the boat. We're going there later to pick up our tickets, said Beatrice. We're going to see the little Lord Fauntleroy, said Gwendolyn. Oh, good, said Maya innocently. That's the play he's got the lead in. The twins looked at each other, but they said nothing then. They drove down the street of elegant shops, dress shops and shoe shops, saddlers and hat makers. It was incredible, this luxury, a thousand miles from the mouth of the river. There seemed to be everything here that one could find in Europe. The dress shops, excited by the twins, they leant out of the cab, peering and arguing. Florette's still got that polka dot muslin in the window. Can we go in and get it, Mummy? You said we could shop properly this month. Can we have new dresses? Mrs Carter nodded. She would be able to pay off the money she owed Florette. Well, n not all of it. She owed money everywhere and Maya's allowance would have to be doled out carefully. Fortunately, Maya herself wouldn't need new clothes for a long time. The child was dressed very plainly, she thought, looking at Maya's blue poplin skirt and white blouse, but the materials were good. But first they stopped at Madame Duchamp's Academy of Dance. Madame Duchamp was a French woman who had wit to understand that the wealthy rubber growers and merchants who came to Manaus wanted to make sure that their children missed nothing they could have, have had in Europe. So she ran classes in ballroom dancing, folk dancing, ballet. The class the twins went to was a mixed one for both boys and girls. There were children of all nationalities, Russian, English, French and, of course, Brazilian, some pure Portuguese, some of mixed race, Indian with Portuguese, black with Indian, for the people of Brazil had, an intermarri had intermarried for centuries and they were proud of their mixed blood. Maya changed quickly into her dancing shoes and turned round to see the twins sitting side by side on a locker, their plump legs sticking out in front, waiting for Miss Minton to come and help them. Miss Porterhouse always put our shoes on and tied up our hair, said Beatrice. So did Miss Chisholm, said Gwendolyn. Maya went ahead into the big room with its tall windows and bar. It was full of chattering, swirling children waiting for Madame de Champ. An old lady with mottled hands sat at the piano, absently touching the keys. A tall Russian boy with red hair came over and introduced himself. I'm Sergei, he said with a friendly smile, and this is my sister Olga. Maya put out her hand. I'm Maya. I'm staying with the Carters. Yes, we heard. A sunny-looking Austrian girl with plaques around her head came to join them. This was Netta Holtman, the daughter of the twins' piano teacher. Maya was usually shy with new people, but the relief of seeing all these ordinary welcoming children was overwhelming, and she was soon chattering in the same mixture of languages that the other children used. She did not realise that every word she'd spoken to the twins had to be thought about and weighed. Madame Duchamp now entered, an elegant French woman of about fifty, with a black bun skewered high on top of her head. So now we're ready. Find a space and point the toe, please. Maya's toe was already pointed. She loved to dance. The old woman 
began to play a chopping waltz. While the children danced, the governesses and the nursemaids sat around on chairs around the wall. Is that the little cousin who comes to live with the Carters? said a friendly looking plump lady on Miss Minton's left and introduced herself. I'm Mademoiselle Lille, the, government, the governess of the Kaminskys, Sergei and Olga. Yes, that's Maya, said M Miss Minton. She's so charming, so graceful. Yes, yeah, she's a good child, said Miss Minton. Mademoiselle Lille looked at her from under her arched eyebrows. And of course, the twins, she added politely. They're always so tidy, so clean. Both women watched the two strolled girls revolving as relentlessly as metronomes to the music. Yes, it's difficult for them, said Miss Minton. They've not been used to having other children. But now your Maya is happy, said Mademoiselle Lille, who seemed to know a little too much about life at the Carters. How musical she is. She and the little Netta and my Sergei also. He must bring her to visit us. The Countess is always wanting that her children meet new friends. The music stopped. Now you will take partners, said Madame Duchamp. Maya looked down at the floor. There were more girls than boys, and she would wait and dance with whoever was left over. A Portuguese boy with rose in his buttonhole claimed Netta. Then she found that Sergei was at her side. Will you? he said, and she nodded happily to see the twins watching her balefully before she turned to, before they turned to each other. They always dance together, explained Sergei. I don't think they like other children. Maya was not so sure. Perhaps next time you can ask one of them. No, they won't be frightened, he said, and laughed. It was a wonderful hour. The shabby old lady had played for the Imperial Russian Ballet School. She coaxed real music out of the battered piano. Maya forgot the twins, forgot the dark and gloomy house, and danced. But five minutes before the end of the lesson, something happened which changed her mood completely. Two men came into the room. They were dressed in black. Black trousers, black jacket, black shoes, and as they walked over to Madame Duchamp, it was as though a pair of gloomy crows had stalked into the room. The larger of the crows put up his hand. The piano fell silent, then both men approached Madame Duchamp and spoke to her in a low voice. Maya couldn't hear what they were saying, but she felt a shiver of unease, and when she looked at Miss Minton, she saw that her governess was frowning. I know nothing of such a boy, said Madame Duchamp firmly. Nothing. The men spoke again, and when she nodded, they turned to the class. Now, please listen very carefully, said the taller of the crows, as though he was speaking to a group of two-year-olds. He had a square forehead and a bulbous nose covered in broken veins. My name is Trapwood, and my partner here is Mr. Low, and we've come to men out on a very important mission. We've come to find a boy who is living somewhere near here who must be brought back to England. Mr Low, the thinner, smaller crow, blinked his watery eyes and nodded. Must be brought back, he repeated in a high voice. Quickly, must be taken back without delay. The boy is the son of an Englishman called Bernard Taverner, who settled out here and is now dead, Mr Trapwood went on. He was drowned when his canoe overturned in the rapids. Now, does anyone know such a boy? The children looked at each other. Those that spoke English translated what the crows had said to into other languages and everyone shook their heads. What does he look like? asked the tall girl. We don't know, nor do we know his first name, but he must be found. Mr Lowe was getting agitated. His voice had ris risen to an even higher squeak, but still the children shook their heads. Well, if you see anything unusual, or anything at all or anything occurs to you that later makes you think you know where he might be found you must go at once to the police station do you understand me said mr trapwood who seemed to think that the children had lost their wits or you can come down to the pension maria and ask for mr trapwood and mr low what has he done asked a brave child the son of the customs officer that's neither here nor there said the taller crow but he must be found and he must be taken back to england there might be good news if it's the right boy, he said. He tried to smile, but he could only manage a sinister leer. We'll be offering a reward, he added in an oily voice. And remember, anyone hiding such a boy would be guilty of interfering with the law, which means they could be locked up, or she, they could be put in prison, squeaked Mr Lowe. 
They left then, and Madame Duchamp called for a final poker, but the likeness had gone out of the day. Sergei knew about the crows. They arrived yesterday on the mailboat, and they've been prowling around ever since, asking questions, he said. I hope they don't catch him, said Netta. Maya hoped so too. She hoped so very much indeed. To be found by Mr Lowe, Mr Trapwood, and be dragged back to England seemed to her a most horrible fate. After the dance class, the twins and Mrs Carter went off to a shop to have lunch and have lunch before their piano lessons in the afternoon. Since the time for Maya's lesson had not yet been fixed, Mrs Carter gave permission for Miss Minton and Maya to wander around Manaus on their own. You will of course not go into any place where they serve native food, she told Miss Minton. And Miss Minton said, no, Mrs Carter, and did not bother to point out that since the Carters had not paid her yet, she could hardly afford to buy Maya a banana, let alone her lunch in a restaurant. But they had a lovely time. It had rained earlier, but now a fresh breeze blew from the river whenever they looked there was... Wherever they looked, there was something to interest them. A howler monkey sitting on a telegraph pole outside the post office, a cluster of brilliant yellow butterflies drinking from the water troughs put out for the horses, a pint-sized child lugging a mule on a rope. Maya bought some postcards to send to her friends and asked Miss Minton if she would like, to send one, would like one to send to her sister, but Miss Minton said her sister thought postcards were vulgar, so she could do without. I think we might have a look in the museum, she said. It's probably free. Perhaps I could offer them my necklace. What necklace is that? said Maya, surprised. She'd never seen her governess wearing jewellery. It's made up of all the milk teeth of my sister's children. She gave it to me as a farewell present. She has six children, so there's a lot of teeth. And Miss Minton in an ex uh, said Miss Minton in an expressionless voice. The museum was behind the customs house, not far from the river, and the docks, it was a and the dock. It was a yellow building with a domed roof and the words Museum of Natural History painted on the door. Inside it was a marvellous jumble of stuffed animals in glass cases. Skeletons hanging from wires, drawers full of rocks and insects and feathers. There were three rooms downstairs and two more upstairs which housed tools and carvings made by Indians from all over Amazonia. Maya and Miss Minton wandered about happily. Some of the stuffed animals were unusual a manatee, a kind of sea cow which looks like a great, great grey potato with little bumps and knobs on his skin, and a forest taras, tarsola. But some were just ordinary animals that people had brought in from the jungle. And in one case, there was a stuffed Pekingese labelled Billy, the faithful friend of Mrs Arthur Winterbottom. Museums do not usually show stuffed lapdogs, but the curator was an Englishman with a kind heart, and Mrs Winterbottom. Winterbottom, who had raised a lot of money for the museum, had really loved her dog. Maya was admiring a shrunken head when she heard a small exclamation and turned to find that Miss Minton was standing in front of a display case showing specimens of dried plants. The plants did not seem to be particularly exciting, but Miss Minton was so absorbed that Maya came over to stand beside her. The Bernard Taverner collection of medicinal plants from the Tajupi Valley she read. The plants were carefully labelled with their names and what they were used for. A few Maya had heard of, quinine bark to treat malaria, morning glory seeds to bring on sleep, but most were strange to her. This is one of those of the most important collections in the museum, said a voice behind them, and they found that Professor Glastonbury, the curator, had come out of his office. He was a fine naturalist, Taverner, Professor was a big portly man with a fringe of white hair framing a pink skull, very blue eyes, and an old linen jacket from which a handkerchief protruded. The handkerchief did not have much to do with the professor's nose, it was used to mop up dye or formalin, wrap up in a delicate wrap up a delicate specimen, or wedge a rickety stand. He'd been putting together the skeleton of a giant sloth and was still carrying one of its claws in its hands. When did Mr Taverner present the collection? asked Miss Minton. Five years ago when he came back from the Tajupi, but he often brought things in. That banded armadillo came from Taverner. He never killed more than he needed, though. Once he had a specimen, he left the rest alone. He sighed, remembering the man who had been his friend. Then the door was flung open. Loud footsteps sounded on the wooden floor and they found Mr Trapwood and Mr Lowe making their way towards them. 
whispered Maya, and was frowned into silence by Miss Minton, who pulled her away from the glass case and led her out of sight behind the manatee. Professor Glastonbury, asked Mr Trapwood, wiping his face. Black suits are not the best thing to wear in the tropics, and he was sweating heavily. The professor nodded. We understand that you knew Bernard Tavener, that he gave a collection to the museum. The professor nodded again. Medicinal herbs. Very interesting. They're over there. The crows looked disappointed. They probably expected stuffed jaguars and enormous throwing spears. We'd like to ask you some questions about Mr Tavener, said Mr Trapwood. Trapwood and Lowe, private, and invest private investigators. He took a card out of his pocket and handed it to the professor. The professor looked at it and gave it him back. I'm afraid I'm very busy. It won't take long. We know that Bernard Tavener died about four months ago. We want to know. What we want to know is the whereabouts of Tavener's son. What we must know, squeaked Mr Lowe. He is to be brought back to Westwood without delay. The professor blinked at him. I'm afraid that won't be possible, he said. Why is that? Because Bernard Tavener didn't have a son, said the professor. Professor, and now, if you'll excuse me. I'm glad, said Maya, as they left the museum. I'm glad he hasn't got a son. I don't know what Westwood is, but it sounds horrible. I suppose it's like a prison, like Wormwood, Scrubs or Pentonville. And Miss Minton said, yes. They were to meet the Carters at the theatre box office at four o'clock. As they crossed the square with its tall brass lamps and flowering trees, Maya was more and more awed. Imagine Clovis acting in there, she said. It's a really famous place, isn't it? Miss Minton nodded. Car Caruso sang there, she said, and Sarah Bernhardt came to act. She was 70 years old, but she played Napoleon's young son, and she was sensational. Goodness, Maya was impressed. If a woman of 70 could act in Napoleon's son, then surely Clovis could manage little Lord Fauntleroy. I'm really looking forward to seeing them again, she said. It's only a week now before they come. The twins and their mother were waiting. We've got our tickets, said Beatrice. We're going to Little Lord Fauntleroy on Monday afternoon and on Saturday we're going to see Twelfth Night. That'll be boring because it's Shakespeare, but Little Lord Fauntleroy will be good. Yes, it is. We saw Clovis rehearsing. He was splendid. The twins stared at Maya. Oh, you aren't going. We got the tickets weeks ago before we knew that you were coming. They're all sold out, aren't they, Mummy? Mrs Carter nodded absently. She was sending the doorman out for a cab. I promised Clovis I would be there, said Maya, fighting off tears. I promise. He'll have forgotten, said Gwendolyn. Actors don't remember people. He'll have forgotten that he ever met you. And they followed their mother to the waiting cab. The twins were wrong about Clovis. He wasn't clever, but he was faithful. And as soon as the pilgrim players arrived in Manaus, he asked where he could find a place called Tufferini or House of Rest and a family called Carter. No one seemed to know about the House of Rest, but he was told that the Carters lived in a bungalow an hour's journey from Manaus and could only be reached by boat. You can't go off gallivanting now, said Mrs Goodley. We've got the dress rehearsal this afternoon, and when you see the theatre you won't want to. It's twice the size of anything you've played in before. This did nothing to cheer Cl up Clovis. <clears throat> he said he felt sick. Everyone feels sick in this dump said Nancy Goodley. The company had taken the top floor of the Hotel Paradiso, which was the cheapest hotel in Manaus. It was also the worst. Grey slugs crawled over the wooden floors of the showers. The lavatories were filthy and the smell of bean stew being tortured to death in rancid cooking oil stole through the rooms and corridors all day. It's no good having the vapours now, said Mrs Goodley sharply. Remember, everything depends on you. If Fauntleroy is a sellout, we can pay off the sharks and get a passage to the next place. But if not, God help us all. They'd left Berlin the n at night and in a hurry without paying the hotel bill. The scenery had only just been saved. The hotel manager had tried to get hold of it to sell, but they'd managed to get it loaded onto a boat in the nick of time. Clovis sighed. He knew his lines. He knew his movements. His part wasn't difficult and his voice seemed to be all right. It was all right most of the time. But sometimes, if only he could have seen Maya before the first performance, Maya and Miss Minton always made him feel safe. But Maya was coming. She'd promised. Clovis stamped on a large cockroach, making its way across the floor, and decided to be brave. And that's the end of chapter four. So story's coming along quite nicely, isn't it? 
what do you think of the twins now? Um, when I first read it, I really wasn't sure about them. And then as the story goes on, I just dislike them more and more. Um, but what do you think to Maya? I'd be interested to um, hear your thoughts, really. What you think of Maya and Clovis and, and Miss Minton and what do you think is going to happen next? Basically, these are all just like little conversations you could be having at home if you've not already read it, obviously. Um, but yeah, I hope some of you are reading along um, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your day. And I am thinking of you lots and missing you lots, but I will hope to see you soon. Lots of love. Bye.